The BC United throwing in the towel just weeks before British Columbia's general election should serve as a serious wake-up call to Canada's political left. However, some may still not be catching that signal, thanks to the legacy media's failure to report on how BC United turning its back on freedom and conservatism played a key role in its party's demise. Let's talk about it. Drea Humphrey here with Rebel News, reporting to you during the tail end of my vacation. That's right, I do get some time off, but when I do, I'm still here talking to you sometimes, and that's because news never gets a vacation, does it? Especially not in British Columbia over the last week or so, where just a day before I hopped on a plane to get away for a little bit, big news shook up BC politics. As many of you now know, BC United's party leader, Kevin Falcon suddenly suspended his party's campaign from the October 19th election and encouraged all who had been supporting his party, including his then 23 MLAs, to get behind John Rusted and the Conservative Party of BC. But what became apparent to me uh, as I've crisscrossed the province and heard from literally tens of thousands of people is the number one major concern that they had, and that is Kevin... If you guys don't do the right thing and be the adults in the room and help bring together that free enterprise, center-right, common-sense coalition, you are going to help elect an NDP government. And all of you that know me know that there is nothing more important to me and my children and your children and grandchildren that we not give the NDP one more day in power than they absolutely have to have. And that's why... Uh, I made the decision uh, that I made as leader of BC United to suspend our campaign. I will be withdrawing our candidate uh, nominations. And uh, in cooperation with uh, John Rustad, we will work together to uh, assemble the best possible team of MLAs and candidates that can serve the best interests of British Columbians. The news comes after failed merger attempts between the two parties and the Conservative Party of BC consistently destroying BC United in election polls for months. But it still served as a massive wake-up call for many on the left, like the governing BC NDP party's Victoria Beacon Hill MLA, Grace Lore. For the last couple of days, I have heard from so many people who are feeling a bit turned upside down by BC politics this week. New donations, support, and volunteers from folks previously supporting other parties. People who don't see their BC in a party that denies the climate crisis, has committed to getting rid of SOGI in schools, and is running candidates that donated to the trucker convoy. I have also heard from parents and family and friends of trans and gender diverse folks who feel extremely anxious. Don't forget, the BC Conservatives tried to introduce legislation to limit the rights of trans kids to play sports. That's right, Lore. Come October, there could be a new sheriff in town. But on a side note, do leftist politicians have some sort of weird form of Munchausen syndrome where they enjoy making gender-confused kids believe society hates them? No. The B.C. Conservatives didn't try and pass legislation seeking to limit trans kids from playing sports. I was there reporting at the legislature when they introduced the Fairness in Women's and Girls Sports Act. And when the NDP government, of course, shot it down before its first reading. It was a woman and girl led initiative proposing that women and girls be protected and have fair opportunity to excel in their sports without biological males impeding on their ability to do so, like is currently acceptable and permitted under the NDP socialist government. But that's far from all that's being permitted that many think should change. You know, perhaps if the left wasn't so hell-bent on cancelling citizens they disagree with and allowed them to freely express themselves without fear of losing their careers or being accused of spreading hate, then Grace Lore would be less shocked to learn that many British Columbians have had enough with her party's radical progressive ways. 
She even had some in her own comments reply to tell her why they will no longer be voting for the NDP. Some who gave similar reasons to why conservative Nanaimo MLA candidate Gwen O'Mahony, who formerly served as a BC NDP MLA, and Chilliwack Cultus Lake candidate uh, Alia Warbus says that the NDP's policies no longer represent them either. Things have gotten very extreme in this province. And I should know that because I'm coming from the progressive left, okay? And I would say the party is squeezing out any kind of piece of common sense or sensibility that's left with a lot of the members. So there's many of us that have moved over and have joined uh, the Conservative Party. It can be a very hostile place. If you do not toe the line, and if you do not agree with the ideology, then you are called a bigot. You could be canceled. They take glee in shutting down people's Facebook pages. It happened to a long time New Democrat that I know, all because he was speaking out on um, issues pertaining to women in sport and, and self ID laws, those kind of things. They were excited when his Facebook page got deleted. You're shut down and it is a toxic situation. I really felt that some of the socialist values that are held within the NDP that seem to separate us as a society around 2SLGBTQ+, around education in the school system, and I think also around sort of the war on drugs and decriminalization, I didn't understand the issues that well. And so to me, I was taking things that people were saying at face value and saying, hey, look, it's as if you're against these communities. That's not the case. It's not about being against any one person or any person that's in the margin of our society. It's about doing what's best for everybody. And when I started to dig into the issues and do the research, I started to understand what the conversation, the narrative was actually about. And it's about doing what's best for all people and not putting any group ahead of each other. The Conservatives catching up to, and even in some cases slightly surpassing the NDP in election polls, suggests the NDP really is losing the plot. Whether it's the power-hungry NDP being the last North American jurisdiction to let go of nonsensical COVID jab mandates against healthcare workers, or David Eby's refusal to join other premiers in opposing the carbon tax that BC has to follow, our soul-gouging house and rent prices, or like Gwen O. Mahoney pointed out, allowing citizens to grab free crack pipes from hospital vending machines— Crack pipes, they can put to good use by smoking hard drugs alongside elderly patients at their favorite care home. And yet, with all of that madness and more being normalized in BC's NDP, it took the BC United's collapse to finally awaken some of the left to the fact that the political pendulum is swinging. And if they don't reposition their grip just right, they might be just about falling off of it. Of course, I blame legacy media for much of their ignorance to what many saw coming a long time ago. With the help of their censorious allies in the state and the social media, the legacy media built such a sad echo chamber for the lefty lores of the country, who are now scratching their head as to what exactly could possibly be the appeal to a leader like John Rustad, who had the audacity to be interviewed by Big, bad, far-right extremist Jordan Peterson, whose dangerous crimes include encouraging men to be present and hard-working husband and fathers, and for all of society to be informed critical thinkers. The nerve. Uh, the number of people dying in British Columbia today on a daily basis waiting for diagnostic services yeah. or surgery yeah. is comparable to the number of people who are dying from the opioid crisis, and nobody's talking about it. Yeah. And it's crazy. So is it any surprise then that leftist media is also failing to inform the public about some of the key catalysts to the collapse of BC United? The media is primarily attributing the fall of BC United to pressures from businesses. The TIE has gone as far as to call Falcon's defection a threat to democracy due to special interest groups trying to control the election. Now, to be clear... I believe that all MLAs and their parties that vehemently supported or remain silent about tyrannical COVID measures and the catastrophic economical social turmoil they caused, which in BC's case was literally all of them, lost the trust of many of their pro-freedom and conservative-minded constituents. 
It's just a few like John Rusted who've done a better job than others at trying to mend that breach in trust. But the first nail in BC United's coffin that further separated the party from its conservative voters took place back in 2021 during the party's leadership race. That's when the party then called the BC Liberals rejected the leadership bid of Aaron Gunn, who will now be happily running with the federal conservatives as their candidate for North Island Power River. But flashback to two weeks after Gunn announced he'd be running for the B.C. Liberals and started making some traction back in 2021, the prominent conservative documentarian was nonsensically accused by the B.C. Liberals Leadership Election Organization Committee of being against reconciliation, even though their only Indigenous MLA running for leadership at the time, Ellis Ross, disagreed and publicly stated that Aaron should be allowed to run. The NDP-like rhetoric used to give Gunn the boot left many of the party's pro-free speech members wondering if the party was actually the right-leaning party it once was thought to be. And later, when Kevin Falcon ended up winning the leadership race, such concerns were only heightened. Which leads me to fatal error number two. The underestimation of the B.C. Conservatives and the exiling of John Rustad. That's the kicker that's led to British Columbia basically now having its own Trump versus Hillary epiphany, especially if the Conservatives overthrow the NDP on October 19th. So how did the Conservatives find themselves in this popular position? In 2022, the B.C. Conservative Party essentially came back from the dead, seeking to become an actual conservative alternative to the B.C. Liberals and the NDP and to restore common sense into B.C. politics. The B.C. Conservative Party overhauled and revamped that party into the Conservative Party of B.C. and began to run serious candidates in by-elections. At the time, I think it's safe to say both Falcon and E.B. thought that whatever the party was up to wasn't really a big deal. After all, the party hadn't had a seat in the legislature for 12 years and barely ran any candidates during any of the elections. So when leftist media began to come after B.C. liberals, then longtime MLA John Rusted, because he dared to retweet a post from former Greenpeace co-founder Patrick Moore that didn't align with the left's climate election alarmism agenda, and then he refused to apologize for it, what did Falcon do? He appeased the left, who will eat their firstborn if it disagrees with them, and kicked Rustad out of the party on his birthday of all days. Now Rustad shifted over to becoming an independent. But meanwhile, the Conservative Party, which needed two MLA seats in order to have official party status, was continuing to establish itself. And then it happened. John Rusted, discarded by Falcon, crossed over from Independent to the CPBC, giving them their first seat and soon to be their new leader, and opening the door for more BC Liberals to cross on through it. I imagine Falcon is still having nightmares about firing Rusted, especially now that his party has been picked through by the Conservatives and their unwanted BC United MLAs are left figuring out how they will even move forward. But perhaps before getting to this point, BC United still could have remained a viable opposition during the election, if it were not for its fatal error number three. The legacy media will tell you that that error was the misfortune of the party having to rebrand themselves by renaming themselves from BC Liberals to BC United because they wanted to separate themselves from being associated with the Trudeau-tainted federal liberals, which they're not associated with. But as I've covered before, a poll that explored that theory told us that that's not really why voters are leaving them. Instead, I believe the third fatal error was after BC United tried to shift back from the NDP wannabe position they were in into conservatives when they realized appeasing the left wasn't serving them well. After all, it was done so poorly. Just a political minute ago, Falcon was taking a page out of Trudeau's How to Offend a Canadian book by referring to the Conservative Party as small fringe with conspiracy theorist members. 
And there's more examples, like when the NDP brought forward a stunt-like motion in 2023 seeking to have all MLAs go ahead and applaud Bonnie Henry's vaccine mandates and to condemn the trucker convoy that had been smothered out a year earlier, Falcon had a real opportunity to make his party draw a line in the sand. And instead, what did he do? Well, according to some MLAs who spoke to me, they were told if you don't agree with that motion not to show up and vote, which left a clear path for John Rustet to come and shine against medical tyranny by being the only MLA to say no to that motion. And then there was Soji123, the parents that are being vilified by the left NDP as spreading hate against trans kids who are simply just wanting sexually explicit books to be out of school and to stop normalizing the sexual indoctrination of kids. Well, Falcon has kind of watered down his response on how he would approach such of things. He says, okay, we'll look at that program that's having that and we'll get parental input. But the conservatives, on the other hand, they got their boots on the ground during protests about this issue to show that they mean business when they say they'll get rid of SOGI123 that's making that happen. And they claim they'll replace it with an anti-bullying system. There's other examples, but I'll give you one more. It is true that eventually Falcon did stand up in the House and call for the BC NDP to drop Dr. Bonnie Henry's reckless COVID vaccine mandates against healthcare workers, admits ER closures and other hospital staffing shortages. But when I pressed him to see if his party were to form government and there was another declared pandemic, had he learned anything? Would they do anything differently? He dodged my question three times. BC United's pragmatic shifts, especially under Falcon's leadership, remind me of biblical scripture about God spewing those who were lukewarm out of his mouth. In addition to his party's demise, clearly illustrating a culture shift from the left, it should also serve as a reminder to all parties, including the Conservative Party of BC, that in a day and age where sadly everything has become so polarized, the people, including centrists, need to know and trust where you stand. Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you conservative? Are you liberal? Because if you're a chameleon party somewhere in the middle, you might just be no more. Drea Humphrey for Rebel News. If you like this political commentary, then give us your email at bcleadershipreports.ca. That way you won't miss out on my upcoming interview with an election outcome predictor on the left with an interesting opinion on what British Columbians should expect for this upcoming election. And while you're there, if you'd like to support more reports like this, including those from the BC campaign trail, please consider chipping in a few bucks to cover the costs to make that possible.